Well, what am I doing here? That's a tough act to follow. I have been truly blessed already this morning, haven't you? Janice, I, uh, I don't think that that was Danny and Dustin. I don't know who it was, but, but that was truly a blessing, and I thank you both very much. And it was also a blessing having second special music with Beth and her two daughters up here this morning, Donna Lisa and Gail. So that was just wonderful. Now, for our visitors, I'm not the one that normally stands up here. When Pastor Charles asked me to take this Sabbath, uh, I told him I would after I went to my knees. I had to see if the Lord had a message that I could share with you. And it was rather interesting because as time went on, uh, it was, first of all, right after the first time, I realized I was to speak on faith. But as time went on, he kept, in my morning prayers, he kept giving me more and more information. And I went to the pastor last week with that. I said, you just have to pray for me. I have to figure out what I need to leave out here because there's so much he keeps giving me on faith. I don't know how I'm going to do this. And he says, well, the answer to that is simple. He says, you make it a mini-series. And he says, you take two Sabbaths with it. And I said, I don't know if I can do that. I've never done that before. And he says, if the Lord gave you that much, he can do it. And, and it was amazing how he did it. Because I'm going to speak today and next Sabbath both on faith. And this isn't one of those messages where it builds and you have to hear the first one to gain a blessing from the second one. Both of them are complete and both of them are important. So if you aren't going to be here next week, you don't have to worry about it. And I'm pleased that there are so many here today to hear this message. One of the things I did in researching this message was look at some of the surveys about Christianity in the world today. And it was interesting to me, because I had done that before in years past, and I don't know whether you're aware of it, but 83% of Americans today profess to be Christians. And when I read that, I say, where are they hiding? Because you don't see it reflected in the lives you run into, do you? But what's interesting in that is it's down from it was about 10 years ago when 87% profess to be Christians. Another one of the, the uh, statistics that I find fascinating, if 83% of the people out there are Christians, then why do only 57% believe in the devil? We as a church believe in the great controversy so we see there is a battle going on between Christ and Satan. What do these people see? And as I pondered over the diversity in those percentages, I said, there can only be two reasons that I came up with. And one is that there are many ministers out there that aren't preaching the Word of God. And there's people just hearing them and believing whatever they preach. And we know that many of the evangelical churches today, all they preach is love. And we know that there's more to it than that. But then again, what's wrong with the people? If they don't believe in Jesus, I mean, excuse me, in, in the devil, are they looking at any of this? Because everywhere I turn, I find Satan in this book, causing trouble. Yeah. 
David told us in Psalms 119, verse 111, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The problem is too many are not hiding that word in their heart. Our scripture this morning that Josephine brought to you, Hebrews 11, verse 6, but without faith it is what? impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently seek him. Are you diligently seeking him? Are you looking for him and looking for what he has for you? And I don't believe that, that many of you are. And I'm sorry to say that. Because I know that the pastor shares my feelings that when Jesus appears in the clouds, I wouldn't want any one of you missing from that exciting event. But if you're not taking time with him daily and not searching his word, you might not have the faith in those last days to be going through that time of trouble. I have run into many people in these last days that are afraid of the time of trouble. And that just surprises me because he who is with us is greater than he who is against us. And if we have that relationship with him, there's nothing for us to fear. Would you please bow our heads while I have one more prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, you know the message that you have put on my heart this morning. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak through me to these lovely believers this day. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will open their ears for spiritual discernment and that each and every one will receive something from the message that I have today and he will take it with them throughout eternity. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where can we gain faith? Turn to the second book of the Bible, Exodus chapter 14, please. I'm going to take you back 3,460 years ago. Israel had been in slavery for about 400 years. Moses had been born. He had killed a man, fled to the wilderness, and for another 40 years, God taught him to unlearn all the things that he had learned. And Moses went to Pharaoh, and he took information predicting plague after plague. And he took that information and asked Pharaoh to let his people go. And you know, as well as I do, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And during each of those first nine plagues, he said no. And when Moses appeared to him that tenth time and told him, unless you paint blood on your doorposts and lintels with hyssop from a sacrificed animal, your firstborn son is going to die. And Pharaoh told him, get out of here. The next time I see you, your life is going to be forfeit. But we know what happened. The Israelites listened to that counsel. And they had the first event of what we call Passover. And they painted that blood on there. And no one went out when that angel of death came over. And Pharaoh lost his own firstborn son. And he called 
Moses to him and said, take your people and go. Get out of my sight. And they went. But then he got his wits about him after the fact. And he said, no, this can't be. So he brought his armies together. All of his horsemen and his chariots and his foot soldiers and they took off after those Israelites. And Israel found themselves with their back to the Red Sea and the Egyptians coming upon them. Look at verse 9 of Exodus 14 with me, will you? But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Piharoth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. Is there faith there? Had they had any reason for faith? They had seen those ten plagues. They had seen their firstborn children saved during those ten plagues. They had reason for faith. But what did they have? They had fear. And how does Moses react to this? Verse 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you this day. For the Egyptians, whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Now look at the next verse. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And we know the story then, don't we? And if any of you have ever seen the Ten Commandments, where Cecil B. DeMille tried to reenact it, Moses raises his hand, and the Lord parted the Red Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but I know when water comes out, what's left behind is muck and mire. But we're told they didn't walk through muck and mire. That seabed was dry, and they passed through on dry ground. God did that for them, and he will do the same for each and every one of us with faith. Now, they didn't have the faith, so how did this come about? Moses had faith. And that's all that mattered, and God was delivering his people. Now, miracles are seen and sometimes quickly forgotten. For we know at Mount Sinai... Moses goes up on the mount and he goes up there for 40 days and the people, what do they do again? They'd seen the 10 plagues, they'd seen the Red Sea parted, but they lost faith again, didn't they? And they had Aaron make them a golden calf. And in, in Deuteronomy 9, verse 14, and you don't have to turn there with me. We're just going to be there a moment. Deuteronomy 9, verse 14, 
God says, let me alone that I may destroy them that blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of thee a nation mightier and greater, greater than they. Moses doesn't let him do it, does he? He says, no. You brought them out. That's going to bring disgrace to you. He says, what I, what I want is my name blotted out of the book if you're going to blot their name out. And we know this was just a test for, for Moses, wasn't it? And Moses passed the test. But that test cost him, didn't it? It cost him many years of his life because where were they supposed to go? They were supposed to go into Canaan, weren't they? Why were they supposed to go to Canaan? Because that was the land that was promised to Abraham. Why didn't they march into Canaan? Because once again, lack of faith. We take 12 men from 12 tribes, go in and scout out the land. They come out saying, Oh, wow, this land is full of milk and honey. But I can't, uh, I can't see how we could ever, you know, take over in this place. They're too strong for us. And only two of the ten said, yes, we can, Joshua and Caleb. But because of the unbelief of those ten was so infectious that it spread throughout the camp, God says, you're not going in. And all those adults that allowed that lack of faith to fill them died in that wilderness. And unfortunately, because of Moses' temper, he wound up dying before he could enter Canaan as well. Are we preparing to enter the heavenly Canaan? Do we have the faith that we need for that? If we're not into his word and if we're not experimenting with our relationship with him, we may, may not be to that point. In Joshua 1 verse 9 God says to Joshua, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And God prepared Joshua for that first battle in going into having uh, a... Uh, Senior moment here. What? Jericho. Jericho. Now, how far is Jericho from Jordan? The Jordan River is only about five miles away. And we know that Joshua sent two more spies in to check out the land and that Rahab the harlot protected them, correct? And so... They come back out, and through the, the, the dialogue of Rahab, we know that the people in Jericho were already frightened. And I, I would say so, because across the river from them, merely five miles away, were over 1.5 million people. That's bigger than Fort Worth. So they had a reason to be fearful. And I'm sure that there were people watching to see what those Israelites were going to do. And can't you, wouldn't you just love to have been there? When Joshua sent the priests out in front of the army with the ark on it, and those priests started walking toward that river which was in flood state, and when their toes touched the breach of the river, go with me to Joshua 3, verse 15. Joshua 3, verse 15. 
And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped from the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up and heaped very far from the city, Adam, that is beside Zaratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until the people were passed clean over Jordan. What a sight. Second time they cross a big body of water. And I can't even imagine what it looks like to see water coming down a river and just piling up in a heap. Can you? But our God can defy all the laws of physics. And all we need is a little faith. Just a little faith. Now, as we go to Jericho, turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. God gave Joshua instructions. You go into Jericho and you put those priests out front with those ram horns as trumpets and you march around that city. Once a day, with the army following behind. But the army's to be silent. No noise. Just walk around. Imagine, if you will, what those inhabitants felt when they saw this happen day after day. Then his instructions were different. About the seventh day, they were supposed to do it seven times. And this time, no trumpets until the seventh time. And then when the trumpets blow, the shout goes up, and the wall comes down, and they march in. Go with me to Joshua 6, verse 15. Let's look at that seventh day. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. And the city shall be accursed even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are in her house, uh, with her in her, the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed when ye take the accursed thing that make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. And they shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat so that people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox, and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence, thence the woman and all that she hath, as she swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel." 
and they burned the city with fire and all that was therein only the silver the gold the vessels of brass and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord and Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had and she dwelt in the house of Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho now how many Israelites died that day what none why because the Lord fought the battle are you aware that archaeologists when they found Israel they found the walls flat except one segment now what do you think would have been in that segment Rahab's house we serve an awesome God Ten plagues, parting the Red Sea. Over and over, we see faith should be built. There are many churches out there that say all we need is the New Testament. But the Old Testament, there are story after story after story to build our faith to prepare us to know that our God is beyond anything in our wildest imaginations. He will protect us. One more verse from the book of Joshua, 24, 15. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods, lowercase g, of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will what? Serve, serve the Lord. Now, they, what I'm asking you this morning is, are you serving the Lord? Or are you one of those people that just says, I'll go to church on Sabbath morning? Because I have to say, I wonder about some of you. And the reason I say that is because look how full this sanctuary is now. But during Sabbath school, many of you weren't here. What are you studying if you don't study your Sabbath school lesson? How much are you digging into God's Word? Is there anyone out there who would like to raise their hand and tell me what extracurricular study they were doing this past week, this past month, or whenever? I don't see hands. Okay, She's, Donna's studying the book of Acts. I wish every hand went up to, so you could tell me what you were studying. Because we need to be building our faith, brothers and sisters. And His Word is the source of our faith. His Word is the only absolute truth that we find in this relativistic society we live in. This Word is the one that tells, hopefully, every one of us in this room that Satan is real. That we don't see that difference that we see out there in the world today. That we are following him. In 1988, the Lord allowed me to do one of the most exciting things in my career. It's actually started before that, but I went to England on a government project. I worked on the SR-71 Blackbird, and I was just thrilled to go on the installation team to England and put that bird, put the, our equipment on that bird. But I also had a three-year-old daughter, 
And she had been in cradle roll ever since she was six days old. We started taking her to cradle roll. And she loved cradle roll. When we got over there, we started searching for a church to take her to. And many of you have probably heard of uh, the city over there, Cambridge. And it's a big college city, and I thought uh, in Cambridge they would uh, bound to have a nice church. Well, we found the church on a little back street, very narrow street. And the pastor welcomed us at the door, and we asked about the cradle roll for our daughter, and uh, we, we don't have cradle roll here. But my wife will babysit her while you go on to your Sabbath school class. And I thought, what's going on here? And we searched. We went to many cities in, in that portion of England looking for a church that was vibrant as this one is, where we have all these children. We could have a school and they were growing. But we found that the church over there wasn't growing. And most of the congregations were as old as I am now or older. And I thought, this just isn't right. And one day, I was going into the post office on base, and I walked past the bulletin board, and I saw an advertisement for our Bible storybooks. Ah, someone cares about our children. And I looked the gentleman up, and he told me sad stories about what was going on in England. And they were going very, very liberal in many of the areas over there. And they weren't following the spirit of prophecy. That's just unnecessary. They didn't believe in Ellen G. White. And that saddened me. But I found out about this independent ministry over there called Gaisley. And once a quarter, they would have tent meetings there. And they would bring people over from Australia and the United States and other areas to speak in their tent meetings. Matter of fact, that's where I first met a gentleman that many of you heard of called Ty Gibson. And he's from Light Bearers Ministries. He's going to be here this spring with ASI. So I hope to renew my acquaintance with him. As I got to know the people in this ministry, I ran into an elderly gentleman there. Well, not elderly. To me, he was elderly at the time, but he was probably no more than I am now. And he was about a head shorter than I am and about 50 pounds lighter than I was and very meek, mild-mannered. His name was Roy. He was a great guy. And... We were down there one time and I found out that he was getting ready to go back to the Netherlands. He had to do some business back there. And we wished him Godspeed and all he was taking with him was a backpack. Well, about a week later, I heard that he was back and the next time I saw him, I said, well, how did the trip go? And he says, very eventful. The capital of the Netherlands is Den Haag. And he was walking down a street in Den Haag late in the evening, the street was mostly abandoned, when he was jumped on by three men. They didn't know what he had, and knowing Roy, all he had was a change of clothes and some toiletries and his Bible in that backpack. Now, that's, that not, that's not much to cling to. But Roy felt differently about it. And he wrapped his arms around the straps. And fortunate for him, these men weren't wielding knives or guns. They were just beating on him. Many people in the world will cry, Help! Police! Roy didn't. Roy said, Dear God, help me. And within a couple seconds, the pummeling ceased. And Roy looked up, and all three men were looking in one direction with frightened faces. And they turned and ran in the other direction. 
Roy watched him, and then he looked where they had been looking. He saw nothing but an abandoned street. Now, I would like any one of you to try to convince Roy that those three men didn't see either his guardian angel or a group of angels heading for them. Because he knows that God saved him. Roy had an experimental relationship with his father and Savior Jesus Christ. That is what each of us needs. We need to have that faith. Open up your bulletins, if you will, to the meditation on the back. This comes from Review and Herald, September 21st, 1886, paragraph 10. It is the privilege of all who comply with the conditions to have an experimental faith to know for themselves that pardon is freely extended to every sin. God has pledged his word that when we confess our sins, he will forgive them and cleanse from all unrighteousness. And we know that that comes straight from Scripture, don't we? 1 John 1, 9. Put away your unbelief. Put away the suspicion that these promises are not meant for you. They are for every repentant transgressor that God is dishonored by your unbelief. Let those who have been filled with doubt only believe the words of Jesus fully. And thenceforward, they will rejoice in blessedness of light. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. They are life. In relying upon the sure word of God, in showing confidence in him, we honor him. And he has said that if we honor him, he will honor us. The sure words of life. You can't rely on promises you don't know. Get into his word, find those promises, and claim them. Now things don't always go the way we'd like them to go. But we know, even when we have hard times, that he sees the end from the beginning. And he will see us through those times. So claim those promises, brothers and sisters. Be in his word. Let him guide you day by day. And don't let the things that Satan has out there distract you from taking the time with him. Thank you.